Hello everyone, this is me, Mila Kachian. I'm here to try to show you something cooler than just tactical operation. And once again, I like to talk about positional stuff, strategy, how to think properly and how to apply those, you know, detailed polishing work and to get stronger in chess. And today, I like to talk about important stuff in positional play. We talk about principle of two weaknesses. What it is principle of two weaknesses? How we apply those things? How we are looking for those things? This position happens uh, between two strong players. World champion Vasily Smyslov and one of my favorite players, Paul Keres. Back to 1951. Black is to play. Let's learn how Paul Keres had played this position and won this amazing game based on one simple thing. Black has better pawn structure. Two islands versus three islands. So typically, this island here, isolated, and that's already one weakness. But one weakness is never enough for you to win the game. Next thing which is good for black in this case, it's clearly better bishop versus bad bishop. Why would I say that? Why would I say this bishop on f3 is so bad? Well, there's a famously known rule of Capablanca, which at some point we're going to get back to that rule as well. I'm going to explain to you more deeply. Uh, Capablanca said a long time ago, if you have one single bishop in a game, Try to keep your pawns on opposite color of squares. If you think about white has a one bishop in a game and they own pawns, they chain standard light squares, which is not good for white. And compared to black's bishop, light color bishop, and all my pawns on opposite color of squares, which fantastically fits with Capablanca rules. So all those things clearly says black is in better shape and black is the side who's supposed to play for win. But again, how to play for win? Let's see. Let's learn. Bishop b1, played by Keres. a5. Well, we need to fix this, we need to nail this b4 move, making sure those pawns are remaining on the light squares and my bishop will be able to attack them. Now we have a threat from bishop c2, which means black has to play, white has to play bishop d1, king g6. So this part, sort of automatical part, because black kings and tries to stay in front of the pawn. So as you see, black king had reached important square. So now we try to stay in front of the eyes of the pawn. And we clearly are improving our position. Next step, we need to build second weakness. Look, g5. So far, once again, poor Keres is perfectly following the rules of Capablanca by keeping his pawns on opposite color of squares towards to his bishop. G5. Why could try to play king f2? But I don't think that will change something bigger because a king e4 clearly bothers. And let's say king e4 and try to jump in here. You can't really play here because bishop c2, you're going to lose all your pawns. You have to go back on here, king e2, and then f5. And most likely it's the best chance, but it's still. I don't think so it's survivable because it looks like you're either going to lose H pawn or B3 pawn. So Vasily Smyslov tried to play differently. He went here king E2. So he tries to stay that way. The a point of his defense, in case if you're going to be playing, let's say, king E4, I'll play king D2. And I defend the square and that square. And probably I will try to penetrate with my bishop E2 and D1. Or maybe even try to play bishop h5. So king e4 here as a tool, as you see, it doesn't do anything. And now look at the technique of Paul Keres. Bishop f5. He's provoking white to play g4 move. Then going back on b1. And finally, Paul Keres creates a contact with g4 pawn f5. Now, if you're going to be playing something like king f2, for instance, then I'll pass you. I play f4. 
I'll simply capture this. And you can't really defend because your king must defend a position. But since you have a two pawns on the light squares, you can't really defend either that threat or this threat. You're going to lose one of your pawns. So this defense doesn't work for white. They have to react on f5 move. And now we are going to create pass pawn on the king side. King g6. Yeah, I guess maybe the best try for white was to play here h4. In the game, it's supposed to play king f2. But even after h4, I don't think so. It's actually like a, you know, holdable because black plays h5, by my opinion. And after this trade, let's say hg, king g5, for instance. No, let's say king h3, we play bishop f5 check. We're going to run here, which hard to stop it. And whenever my, let's say, pawn had reached this, I can try to move my king here, or I can try to be more aggressive and play bishop d3 with idea to meet in case of king h3 to come from behind. And that should be quite annoying for you to deal with. And I think in general, this position, I mean, I don't think so. It's actually, let's say, holdable. I mean, I think it's simply bad. After king h2, king h3, let's say this. I don't know. I can play king f5. And if you go up, I probably will try to sweep all your pawns eventually. If you go here, then simple distraction. And I think it's simply dead last. Maybe that's why Smuzzle didn't play h4 move. He tried to stay uh, defensively king f2. Once again, we are following the rules of Capablanca by trying to keep our pawns on squares opposite to my bishop. And finally, whenever this pawn is nailed, that pawn is nailed, my king comes. And here, I guess last trick, here, Smutlov just resigned. Why it's trick? Because it's a Tsukswang. And now if you go King H2, and I'm ready to jump on King E4. And you can't really hold this because after this, you're dead last. So we learn how from position, which looked like completely completely nothing, like almost equal, black simply had outplayed their opponent. In order to complete this, let's say, lesson, I'd like to give you a second example. And let's try to, since we talk about like a great legacy, Paul Keres, I did prepare for you his next game, which is quite similar for the same type of position. In second game, Paul Keres played against Khan, I think it was Soviet Championship or Russian Championship, I'm not sure. Anyway, back to the point. We still have a clearly better position. According to Blanca Rus, once again, bishop is light, pawns on dark squares, nailing those pawns here, which means we are clearly in better shape. And now look how Paul Keres is creating second weakness. He has two isolations here. First, he does h5 and h4 which means he nails this pawn to be on the light square, which means eventually I can attack that pawn. He opens space for the bishop to jump here. And it's already, by the way, quite direct threat. Now, what's the game plan? If you're going to try to move your bishop, let's say move your king over here, and let's assume this, this, this. Let's assume you're going to have this defense, sort of. Then what I'm going to do, I play f6, I play g5, I'll strike here, I'll make you take my pawn, let's say f6, you're staying, g5, you're staying, staying, and my king comes here and I win the game. Easy. So that's why white saw those kind of stuff and white tried to play bishop g4. But unfortunately, it didn't work out because after key bishop f5, King f6, 
Now, if you play king e3, after this, I play g5, and you did lost. So you have to try to play here, bishop, after this, bishop g4, king f6, white try to play this, king f5, king e3, and f6, and same thing happens again. Why? I mean, obviously here, black will, they will create a pass on the king side, and, and then I'm going to win the game. Okay, I mean, I can continue this a little bit, but I mean, that was going to happen to you. Then I'm going to run with my king towards the queen of pawns, and I'm going to win the game. So you saw this two example of this principle of two weaknesses, and that's how we build them, and from legacy of Paul Keres. And again, at very last, I'm going to show you another important example, by my opinion, which clearly shows this principle of two weaknesses. Game between another my favorite player, Alokine. I have, I guess, way too many favorite players. But when I was a kid, I used to study those games of Alokine a lot. All right, now we're going to have a little bit different material. So extra pawn looks like clearly domination, but it's not enough for white to win the game because typically... A queen and knight as a combination of pieces gives so much trouble. So look for technique of Alokai. First, he does bishop d3. In this case, he wants to build targets for his bishops, and targets are on the light squares, bishop d3. Then he's going to try to undermine situations on, on the king's side. So since we have a clear target here, we need to try to play h5 and create a second weakness here. And finally, Alokine reaching the g6 square. Now, these kings become more vulnerable, pawns are become separated, and we have more targets to attack. Bishop e4. And now, again, we are nailing this pawn to be on the light squares. By the way, again, we're trying to follow the rule of Capablanca. Remember this, please. Remember, that's how we deal with situations when now we have one single bishop in a game. h6 happens in a game. A little bit restriction. Anytime when you play queen and bishop versus queen and knight, always try to trade the queens. Remember, in endgame, bishop is always will dominate, most of the times, will dominate over the knight. In middle game or complex endgame positions, queen and knight, it's always tricky. So queen d3, and after this, game, it's simply over. I guess this is a little bit technique of Al Alokine. And finally, Tsuk Tsuang. I'm sure there's other ways for win was as well, but I think Alokine chose to be like really safe, avoiding any tricks from Knight. And Zemish simply resigned here after Bishop E4. So we learned three short examples how to apply what it means principle of two weaknesses. So I hope you like this lesson. I hope you learn this lesson and um, make sure you can apply those tools in your own game. Thank you for your time and good luck to you guys.